glad and glorious Sabbath to you, dear friends. Thank you once again for joining us in worshiping our Lord, our God, our Maker. We thank you again, friends, for your prayers and your continued support. We pray that God will bless you and your homes and prosper you in heavenly, overflowing righteousness. I'd like you to turn your thoughts with me today, please, to the book of Patriarchs and Prophets, page 496, paragraph 3. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 496, paragraph 3. The prophet says, Covetousness is an evil of gradual development. Achan had cherished greed of gain until it became a habit binding him in fetters well nigh impossible to break. Now this came to me as a surprise, friends, that it wasn't a one-time event that Achan did in taking that which God had said is purely unto the Lord. We're told that Achan had cherished this greed of gain until it became a habit, binding him in fetters well nigh impossible to break. The prophet continues, while fostering this evil, he would have been filled with horror at the thought of bringing disaster upon Israel, but... His perceptions were deadened by sin, and when temptation came, he fell an easy prey. Oh, friends, how devastating it is. Achan stopped realizing the corporate nature of sin. He stopped realizing sin had so blinded him to the reality that sin, as secretively as we may engage in it, taints our character, and as a result, influences those around us. So here we are told, friends, covetousness is this evil of gradual development. Greed of gain had been cherished over time until it had gained the supremacy in the soul. And friends, today God is warning us to live selfless lives like Christ, not selfish lives like the devil. Today we are invited to look to the example of Jesus. Today we are invited to invest ourselves not in the world, but in the Lord our God. And today, friends, I invite you to please, please look to the Lord. Perhaps it's covetousness, perhaps it's something else. Whatever it is, friends, that like Achan's experience is causing your perceptions to be deadened. I plead, friends that before it's too late, you would turn to the Lord with everything you have, with all that you are, and ask Him to have full possession of your soul. I pray that this Sabbath, dear friend, will be a Sabbath of deliverance to you, a Sabbath of overcoming, overwhelming power. Please join me in prayer as we begin today. Dear Father, thank you so much. What a sacred privilege, the highest honor, that we have to be in the presence of our Almighty God. Thank you once again, Father, for ushering us into these holy Sabbath hours. And thank you for desiring to do much more than what we could ask or imagine. Thank you, God, for your word is sure. And God, you have promised that you will not leave a stone unturned in our salvation. And so we pray that God, as we turn to you away from the world, Help us this Sabbath day to look to you, to come to you, and to stay with you forever. Teach us, God, what it means to abide in Jesus and to plead with thee to abide in us day by day through your word, through the moving of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the ministration of angels. Thank you for how hard they work for our salvation. Thank you, God. We thank you for how all of heaven is interested to see the ones whom the Lord loves eternally saved. Thank you for the privilege to worship you again this Sabbath day. Please set us apart for yourself, dear God. Bathe and anoint us, please, with your Holy Spirit. Bless your child who you have prepared with your special word. May it revive us in thee 
and keep us in thee for eternity. Thank you so much, God, for these overflowing mercies and divine blessings. May your name be lifted up, O oh dear God, in and through our lives. May your name be magnified in our homes and outside our homes. In the highways and byways, God, help us that we may magnify Jesus before an unbelieving world. Thank you so much, God, for loving us beyond measure. Teach us to live glorifying your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thy arm alone and our defense is And ages in thy sight are like an evening dawn, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. continue on in the book of Daniel. Um, and today, again, we have some heavy material, so I hope you all are prayed up and that you're praying for me. Um, we are going, our scripture reading is going to be um, taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, which says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So our talk for Sabbath school is entitled Standing for Christ. Standing for Christ. And so we're going to get into this. But let me give a little bit of background information after we pray. Father God, I ask once again that you just fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lead us into truth. Be with this study this morning, Lord. And help us, Lord, to garner what you want us to take from it. And then, Lord, mold our minds and our characters to be more like you because of what we hear. Let us, Lord, be malleable to the effects of the Holy Spirit. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So the background now is last night we did Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to skip Daniel chapter 2, one of my favorite uh, chapters of Scripture, but I'm, I'll touch on it here. You remember in Daniel chapter 2, somebody had a dream. Who was it that had a dream in Daniel chapter 2? Nebuchadnezzar. What did he see? He saw an image. And I didn't say this last night about sleeping, but one of the reasons sleep is so important is that sleep is also when we naturally deal with trauma. I'm gonna say that again. Sleep is when we naturally deal with trauma. So recent research has shown that when you sleep, the, the, the neurotransmitter, uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine is released 
And it is when you sleep that you actually get to, de- to manage and deal with emotional scars and trauma. A lack of sleep will lead to poor mental health because it's when you sleep that your body actually processes. And this happens in the rapid eye movement stage of sleep. When you dream, your dreams aren't just nebulous things. It's actually your body and your mind working through issues, problems, challenges, traumas. We start there with a man, a king named Nebuchadnezzar, asleep. And in this dream, he sees this giant uh, image, this giant statue, and we, you remember that the head is of gold and it goes all the way down. We go through, I'll show you a picture of it later on, with all of the different kingdoms that it represents. And finally, a stone is cut out without hands. And you remember what happens? The stone smashes against the feet of this, uh, this, this uh, image and shatters the whole thing into dust. The wind comes and sweeps it away and a mountain raises up. A whole new kingdom is created that lasts forever. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream because his trauma, his issue is, what is his legacy? How long will his kingdom last? How safe is he as the king of Babylon? So when, it, when he sees this image, and then ultimately Daniel is the only one who's able to give the explanation, when he says, you, King Nebuchadnezzar, your Babylon is the head of gold. Can you imagine? Nebuchadnezzar dusted his shoulder off. All right, that sounds about right. But it went to his head literally, and from there Nebuchadnezzar began to do something that we as Adventists really are careful of, different from most denominations. I'm actually going to read you from the Spirit of Prophecy, Manuscript 63, 1899, which is a statement about what the toes represent in that image, and I'll show you the image again in a second. The mingling of churchcraft and statecraft meaning the mingling of the church and the state, the government and the religious bodies, is represented by the iron and the clay. That's the feet. This union is weakening all the power of the churches. This investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recoil upon themselves. There's a warning that when the church and the state come together, and this political cycle, I don't have time to get into it, it is one of the issues that has come to the forefront. The idea that the church and the state should actually be working together. And so when that happens in ancient Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar erects a, a statue. And interestingly, it's like, 60, it's like six, 600 by 60 by 6. It actually lays out to be in dimensions like 666. It's a giant statue about 90 feet high. Um, and that is what he does. So here's the story of it. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And you can see the two of the six is there, 60 cubits, six cubits. So it, it, it winds up being like a, the dimensions are 666. Um, he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. 90 feet tall, he sets up this image. And this is Nebuchadnezzar, great and mighty, powerful king, um, very real in history. Everyone kind of knows about this guy. This is what the image would have looked like in his dream. And so you remember it was the head of gold is Babylon. The arms and torso of silver represented Medo-Persia. We'll talk about that at at the next service. The the thigh and waist of bronze was Greece. Legs of iron was the pagan Roman Empire. Then the feet of iron and clay is modern, more modern times, represents how the Roman Empire got broken up and what will happen up to the last days of Earth's history, right? So that's where we, we leave off. So you get an understanding that this is what he saw and he ultimately erects a statue. Verse two, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So he sets up this image in hopes that by getting everyone to recognize, worship, and honor it, he can extend his time as king. Nebuchadnezzar is looking to elevate himself to the level almost of deity. Verse 3, 
Then the princes, the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So this mighty sea of dignitaries is standing in front of this idol. Notice the, the common people aren't there. These are all of the leaders. These are all of the important people, all standing there. And among them are the princes from Israel we talked about last night that were also taken captive. And what do they ask them to do? Well, in verse 4, it says, Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. To you it is commanded that at the time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. So he says, listen, when you start to hear the music, when the music plays, that is the time for you to fall down. And notice, it's not just to fall down, it's to fall down in what? And worship. That's the point of this, to get them to worship this image because there's a trade-off in worship. Nebuchadnezzar wants the image worshipped so that his gods will give him longevity and favor. Verse 6, And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So then, this is where you see the mixing of church and state. If you don't do what the religion of the government says, you will be punished. In this case, you'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. Terrible outcome. Why a furnace? Why did, why, I mean, this is a weird way to execute people. Very unique in all of human history. Well, it's because in Babylon there were no stones. They had no stone to quarry to build their structures. So Babylon had to master the art in kilns, in furnaces, of making stones. And what archaeologists have actually found, to show you that the Bible is very accurate, they have found the literal stones with the stamp of Nebuchadnezzar on the stones. His name stamped on the stones. So when they built a building, and like you see all those bricks on the wall, each one would have had a stamp that said Nebuchadnezzar going all the way up. Kind of like a Gucci sweater, you know, like, just like gaudy all over the place, right? His name was on everything. Verse 7. And here's, here's where it gets interesting. So at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down. And what did they do? They worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Nebuchadnezzar's in his glory. He's sitting on his throne. He's watching this whole thing happen. All these dignitaries, most of whom actually don't worship his gods. They're taken from other places like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have other gods, but here they are bowing to the image he has set up. He is in his glory, Nebuchadnezzar. And how does he get them to do it? through obviously threat of a fiery furnace. A lot of people, once he said, or you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace, they were going to bow, right? But he added one thing to flavor this. What was it? Somebody said it. Music. Isn't that interesting? You threaten to kill him. Why do you need to play music? I mean, what, what, you know, isn't just killing them enough? Why was music played? Why is music a part of this false worship? And if Daniel, in his life, like in his prophecies, is actually foretelling how it is that we are to live at the end of time, could it be that encoded and hidden in this story is a warning that you can't just listen to any kind of music? Could it be that at the end of time, music itself would be used in order to lead people to false worship. I told you I'll be going somewhere today. So let's look at music. I presented this a couple years ago, but I'll, I'll go over some of the slides and then give you some new stuff. Just as a reminder, the way music works, remember that the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, the 33% of your brain that is what makes you human, the next smartest animals, their frontal lobe is only 13% of the brain, and that's porpoises and chimpanzees. 
After the porpoise and the chimpanzee, you think like your dog is really smart. The dog's brain is only about 7% frontal lobe. A cat, 3%. Sorry to our cats. Um, so the human brain is designed to not only reason and be logical, it is designed to worship. This is why the seal of God goes in the, on, the, on, the, on your forehead. It's not the, your forehead like just sitting on the surface. It is actually the, the, the configuration and the status of your frontal lobe that is the seal of God because it is in the frontal lobe that character resides. When you listen to music, it bypasses the frontal lobe. It bypasses the part of your brain that actually is discerning and helps you to, be, to think critical. And it actually goes in through the auditory centers of the brain. And so it gives you emotional feeling. My family's Jamaican. And I'm, sometimes I'm in Jamaica preaching. And they like reggae music in Jamaica. I hope you guys aren't listening to it. But they like reggae. And they don't have noise ordinances in Jamaica. So the music is super loud. And you'll be in church and somebody go by with a boo do 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 bass and the whole the pew starts shaking, whole church. And you'll see people just start tapping and moving even though they're in church. Because music moves you without you telling yourself to move. Nebuchadnezzar understood this. It bypasses the frontal lobe and affects your emotion. In fact, besides drugs and sex and alcohol and, 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 and food and water, one of the ways that dopamine is released in the brain is through music. How powerful is music? Well, it stimulates simultaneously the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. It boosts learning and information intake. Learning itself can actually be increased five-fold. And look at this. Music can aid in the production of serotonin, affecting the feelings of satisfaction. Did you get that? So last night we talked about serotonin. Music can help you do that. Now, if I had time to really do a full music seminar today, I would show you from the medical literature that it shows that if you play certain types of music, it actually aids in the healing of wounds. And if you play other type of music, a surgical wound heals slower. Classical music, hymns, um, spirituals, they actually help wounds to heal faster. Heavy metal, hip hop, reggaeton, all that music, the wounds heal slower. It actually physically affects you what you listen to. Now, how does it affect you spiritually? Well, in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 22, um, this story is written of David and Saul. I won't read the whole story, just as one verse to make the point. And it came to pass when the, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit did what? It departed from him. Here's the question, young people. If you can take a harp and play an evil spirit out of someone, do you think you can play music and play an evil spirit into someone? Absolutely. I tell, I've told you guys this story before, but I think for those new students, I should tell it again. There was a group called Color Me Bad. They had a hit song, number one hit song called I Wanna Sex You Up. It went number one all around the world. And one of the, one of the guys, there was, it was a, two white guys and a black guy, so they came up with a new, the name Color Me Bad. I guess they thought it was kind of creative, I'm not sure. Um, and so one of the guys, the black guy in the group actually was raised a Christian. And so after they had this multi-million dollar record deal, number one hit record around the world, album that was selling all over the place, they actually decided, he decided, the black guy in the group, to leave and go back and be a pastor. Isn't that incredible? He walked away from it, all the money and everything, and he's a pastor to this day. He says that when they made that hit song, I Wanna Sex You Up, they called witches to the studio. And the witches put a curse on the album as they're recording it. You can do the Jay-Z, when he, if you go online and look at the, when they, when they, uh, the video of the making of the song 99 Problems by Jay-Z, one of the things the camera actually focuses down on, I should have put the picture on here, is a blue book called Magic White and Black. As Jay-Z walks in to tell you that this song is under the impression of spiritualism and spirits. 
So th- this pastor, go back to him, says that when they were making a song, I Want to Sex You Up, they brought witches into the studio and the witches went in and the witches uh, put a spell on the song that when 13 and 14 year old girls heard the song, they would have the courage to give up their virginity. So they put a spell on the song. Now the black guy raised the Christian, can really sing. He thought, this is just stupid hocus pocus. This doesn't mean anything. And when the, album, when the song went number one around the world, they began to get fan mail from all over the world, basket after basket of fan mail. And he says, what blew him away is that almost every letter they received was from a girl around 13 or 14 years of age. And each one said the same thing. Thank you for making this record. It gave me the courage to lose my virginity. If you can play an evil spirit out of someone with music, do you think you can play an evil spirit into someone? And if that is the case, how much more does it matter what we listen to? Now watch this. Y'all ready? So, the question is, does Satan still use music to inspire false worship? This is Jay-Z, that's his rock, rock, um, rock aware, Rockefeller symbol that he's holding up. And when he comes out on stage, Jay-Z, now he's kind of washed up a bit now, um, might be in trouble with P. Diddy, but we'll see. When he walks out on the stage, he says, and all the rappers do this, they say, get your hands up. Why? Because the Bible tells you that when you lift your hands to someone, it's a symbol of what? Worship. The first thing the rapper says is, get your hands in the air, except they use curse words to tell you to do it. Then they tell you to hold your hands up. Then Jay-Z would say, I, his, one of his lyrics says, I am Jehovah God MC. And now you can write, go and look up the lyrics. That's why they call Jay-Z Hova. It's short for Jehovah. He's from, and hip hop was based on a religion called the 5% Nation of Islam. The 5% Nation of Islam very, started in um, New York City. It, it teaches that the black man is God and the white man is the devil. So when you, and the irony is, who actually bought all of this hip hop wasn't black people, it was white suburbanites. That's how the music got popular. They didn't even realize they were buying r- lyrics and songs when these black rappers are like the Wu-Tang Clan and everybody's calling themselves God or, it was literally from a demonic religion that teaches that foolishness. And so with that you start to see that this is false worship. Now, one of the guys that has really kind of been interesting is this dude, just to show you how powerful music is. This is Kanye West. I want you to notice that on his t-shirt is um, a Baphomet symbol. Now, I don't have time to get into who Baphomet is right now, but Baphomet is a demonic symbol um, that is half human, half goat, half male, half female, and he is a symbol from, from Greek mythology also. He was called Pan. The god Pan, who was the god of debauchery and wine and parties. And he's also where you get the the term Peter Pan from. You notice Peter Pan played music and who followed him? Boys followed him to Neverland. Can't get into that now. But this is what Kanye West lyric says. It says, I sold my soul to the devil. That's a crappy deal. Least it came with a few toys like a Happy Meal. Now, Then, of course, he came out with Jesus is king. Everybody said, look, Kanye West is a Christian. He made a gospel album. And everybody was celebrating. People were bumping this in church. Playing Kanye West, Jesus is king. But did Kanye West really change? Well, this is what the Church of Satan said when Kanye West dropped Jesus as king. The Church of Satan's tweet was, Satan is the best friend Kanye has ever had as he will keep him in business all these years. And Kanye has shown you, and I'm not being judgmental, but he has shown you, he is not normal. I mean, what does he think he is, a superhero? Why has he got a mask over his face? And when they sold him the superhero mask, didn't they tell him you got to cut the eyes and the mouth out? You're not supposed to keep the eyes and the mouth covered. You know why in the occult they do this? It's the same reason they wear dark shades inside. Because they want to signal to you, 
that they will not let light in. The reason everybody was in these dark shades and you're sitting inside of a studio that is three times brighter than this and they're wearing these dark shades is to say, we will not let light in. It's a statement in the occult. That's what he's doing and he walks around with a, I don't know how you walk around like this. I trip over something. No, let's go a little deeper. Y'all hold on now. Because the music of the day is trying to lead you to worship. And where did the music in Babylon try to get you to worship? It was the pagan gods of Babylon. And those gods, one of them was named Bel. We talked about the god Shaq. We talked about some other one. They had a whole, whole uh, 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 panoply of gods. So they're all trying to get you to worship a god. Except in the last days, we are told, Revelation chapter um, uh, 16, we're told that spiritualism would rise up. I want to submit to you that the gods that the modern day musicians want to lead you to is the god of spiritualism. It's the devil himself. All right. Don't get mad now. I'm warning you. It's all in the pictures. One of the interesting things, I told you I don't get mad. This on the left side is Taylor Swift doing Willow. This is the, you can see the imagery on the right. That is not normal Christian imagery. But in order to be fair to her, I want her to speak for herself, right? Because I know a lot of you are big fans of probably some of your fans of Taylor Swift. So let me show you what she actually says. Here's her lyrics. They're burning all the witches, even if you aren't one. They're, they got their pitchforks and proof, their receipts and reasons. They're burning all the witches, even if you aren't one. And look at what she says at the end. So light me up, light me up, light me up. What is she saying? I didn't say it. Maybe that's how the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl last year, because they weren't that good. My point is, when you listen to this music, now I want you to, as Christians, you are young people, so I know some of you are at different stages of your journey, but I want to leave you with this, I want to give you this idea, like Nebuchadnezzar in that valley, if this is the music you're listening to all week, and it is being driven by dark spirits, demonic spirits, if witches have put spells on the music you're listening to, what do you think happens when you come to church and you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit? You know what happens to young people? It was what happened to me when I was a young person. And I started listening to groups like Public Enemy and listening to all of the Rastafarian groups like, like Black Uhuru and, 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 and Bob Marley and the Wailers and all the rest of these guys. And eventually the spirit that I was entertaining all week and the spirit that entertained me all week was incompatible with the Holy Spirit I ran into when I went to church. And I grew to not be able to stand church. In fact, I deplored church. I did not want to go to church at all. What I'm telling you is that there are some who say, you know what, I just don't like church. I don't get a vibe out of church. And they don't realize they are being programmed by demons all week by what they have on Spotify. And they don't realize that it is working against the church. And because you spend so much, and you guys are, uh, uh, being in this setting, it's different. You get more time exposed to God than a kid at home. But because many of them, the only exposure to God they get is a few hours, maybe two hours on Sabbath. And all week, they are literally standing in front of Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And the music is playing all week. All right, one more artist, and then I'm gonna move on. Y'all ready? All right, now don't get, nobody get mad at me. If I'm in the cafeteria, don't run up on me and throw grapes or nothing. All right, there you go. Billie Eilish. Shh, I'm, I, I do whole music seminars. I go in deep on all these different artists, but this one is of special importance to me because one of my good friends is a pastor and he has only one child. He and his wife had one child. And she started listening to this artist and he called me in tears and said, you gotta help me. She started listening to this artist and I don't recognize my daughter anymore. So let's see. Well, the name of her song is All the Good Girls Go to Hell. That's a start that tells me, this is probably someone you ought not be listening to, right? Just the name of the song. I'm only gonna take just a few. I, like in the full music thing, I would, I would give you more. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of lyrics. Look at this. 
She says here, hills burn in California, my turn to ignore you. Don't say I didn't warn you. All the good girls go to hell. Look at this, because even God herself has enemies, and once the waters start to rise and heaven's out of sight, she'll want the devil on her team. And then she says, my Lucifer is lonely. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really hang out with people who have a Lucifer, personally. So why would you let this into your brain, bypass your frontal lobe, as she program, programs you about having a Lucifer? And I know this is tough stuff. It was tough for me when they told me about my music when I was a kid. But I thank God somebody was brave enough to stand in a pulpit and say, listen, this music will destroy you. So let me show you one more piece from her. She says, the debt I owe, she says, I gotta sell my soul. This is from her song, Bury a Friend. The debt I owe, gotta sell my soul. Here she is, someone else telling you they sold their soul. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't believe them because that picture tells me she did. Because I can't say no, no, I can't say no. Then look at the chorus of the song. Again, I'm trying to reach those of you who may not be that convicted on this. Step on the glass, staple your tongue. That's enough for me to stop listening right there. Bury a friend, try to wake up. Cannibal class, look at the last part there. Killing the son. Who is the son? Jesus. Jesus. Did you know, and let me read the last part, bury a friend, and then the last line is, I want to end me. This is a horrible lyric in a time when kids are emotionally unstable, when we worry about kids doing self-harm, here's a pop artist basically promoting a child harming themselves. That line, killing the sun, did you know that even to this day, when I was in Haiti, I went, um, Haiti has the most powerful, pure Christians I've ever met in my life, I've met on the island of Haiti, in the island nation of Haiti. Haiti is an amazing, from a spiritual place, the Christians there are just powerfully amazing. And I was preaching at a church and uh, on a Wednesday night in, in Ponson de Haiti, out in the provinces, far from Port-au-Prince, the, head, the, 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 the um, capital. And while I'm preaching, I have a wonderful lady interpreting into Creole for me. She's just, she's more animated than I am. It was amazing. And the demon worshipers, the voodoo people were so upset. The church was packed with people listening to the message that they surrounded the church with their rah-rah bands. I don't know if anybody here has Haitian roots. And they play these drums and they dance and they, it's very provocative. And they surrounded us. And I said, what? So, and so they tried to lead us. And the, again, music, it was the drums. And when you hear the drums, you want to follow the drums. It was weird. They started playing the drums. And then what happens is, they go toward, they leave from the church and start going down the road. And many, I was with a whole bunch of people from Loma Linda. I was the only black one, so I had no intentions of following these people. But my colleagues did. And these Haitian elders came running out. No, don't go, don't go. And one of the surgeons that was with me said, why not? We want to go. We want to see what they're, he said, they're going to raise the dead. I said, listen, this ain't Scooby-Doo, brother. I'm not following nobody to do nothing. But here's where it gets deep. The purpose of the rah-rah band happens only at Easter time, where the voodoo people, they celebrate that Satan killed Christ on the cross. When I saw these lyrics from Billie Eilish, that's what came to mind. You see that? Killing the sun. So what happens, young people, now I want you to stop. Don't think about who's sitting next to you. This is a very serious spiritual moment for some of you. I want you to think about what it means for your eternity if this is what is washing over your brain, unfiltered by your frontal lobe. Unfiltered by the part of your brain that causes you to think critically, to analyze, and to reason. Satan was the choir director in heaven. He knows music better than anyone. The Bible says he was built with pipes and tabrets. He is a living, breathing, musical instrument. Young people, if you think you can listen to Satan's music and not be uh, 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 troubled or poisoned, you do not realize that the angels, perfect in their glory, one third of them followed him. 
And you're not as strong as those angels. You know what the Bible says about this? Ecclesiastes 7, verse 5 says this. Remember this, this, this verse. Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes 7, 5 says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of what? The song of fools. How does the Bible define a fool? The Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But then you know what the Bible says? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You are better off coming to church and hearing the rebuke of the wise, coming to church and hearing sermons that step on your toes. You're better off sitting through classes and lectures, uh, reading scripture in the spirit of prophecy that makes you uncomfortable, makes you have to deal with your sinful state, makes you see your need for Jesus Christ than to listen to songs that tell me, that tell you, you can do whatever you want, stay the way you are, and nothing's going to happen. Those are the songs of fools. And it's what most of us grow up on. I challenge you. Think about what you're listening to, especially if you're struggling with your spiritual walk. Here's what Ellen White says. Letter 1, 1887. Satan stands ready to infatuate the mind and soul to pursue a course directly contrary to God's express will, that he, might, that he may separate that soul from God, and he interposes his temptations and gains control over the mind and the heart's affections. This is Satan's studied plan. What is Satan's studied plan? To lead souls to turn from one mighty in counsel to the persuasion of minds who have no love for God, no love for the truth. He wants you to be a fan of Taylor Swift and Billie Eilish, and Kanye West, and Kendrick Lamar. He wants you listening to them because they will sing you the songs of fools. He wants you to, to be devoted to them, dedicated to them. He wants that to be the image set up in your heart. She says this, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 12. Music has occupied the hours which should be devoted to prayer. Music is the idol which many profess Sabbath-keeping Christians worship. The devil has no objection to music if he can make that a channel through which to gain access to the minds of youth. So here's where we get tough. I'm going to run out of time on this one, but let me hit this anyway. So here comes the tough question. What about church music? What about music we call Christian music? Well, here, here's what Ellen White says. Anything will suit his purpose, Satan's purpose, that will divert the mind from God and engage the time which should be devoted to his service and which will exert the strongest influence in holding the largest numbers paralyzed by his power with a pleasing infatuation. Music is made one of Satan's most attractive agencies to us ensnare souls, but when turned to a good account, it is a blessing. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. When abused, it leads, to the, leads the unconsecrated to pride, vanity, and folly. When music is allowed to take the place of devotion and prayer, it is a terrible curse. Young people assemble together to sing, and although professed Christians frequently dishonor God and their faith by their frivolous conversation and their choice of music, it is not congenial to their taste to make sacred music their choice. One of the hallmarks, Jesus warns when you pray, not to use vain repetition, as the heathen do, for they think they do, shall be heard for their much speaking. Repetition, senseless, over that's what the voodoo people did, just a chant over and over and over and over again till you get into like a, you get like into a, into a, into a um, trance. So I'm going to give you an example. I like to just use the evidence. That's the best way to do it. I'm going to show you the difference between a hymn and some of the modern praise music. I'm not even going to talk about the style of music because I've been to some of our institutions and I, literally it, you need, it's darker than a movie theater. They're having Friday night vespers and the place is pitch black. The stage is like old heavy metal poison concert or something and they got lights shooting up from the background and smoke. I'm like, what you need smoke and lights and darkness if you're worshiping the God of light? You can't even read your Bible in there. They call it worship. And this 
is what they want you to get. I'm warning you young people because you are in an atmosphere here where you are allowed to thrive spiritually. It won't be like that everywhere you go. You've got to be discerning young people. And I know you can be. That's why God has you here. So watch this. Lyrics to some of the, this is Bethel. Now the interesting thing is, there's only four groups making Christian, basically making all of the contemporary Christian music now. Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation, and one more. I can't remember. remember. Who? Whoever that is. Them four. Right? There's only four. So all the praise music you listen to is basically coming from four places. If you go back, and I don't have time to get into it, but if you go back and read the Second Vatican Council from the 1960s, what the Catholic Church said is, one of the ways that they can make the Protestant churches not be as strong as they are is to change the music in the Protestant churches from hymns to songs that are not doctrinal. That when you listen to these songs, there's no doctrine in them. They just make you feel good. Now, evidence. I like evidence. Here it is. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. What? The fountain I drink from. Oh, this is my song. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Because you are good, 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 you are good. Oh, 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 right? Then look at this. And let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, 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 he is my song. What does that even mean? What do you take away from this? He's the fire inside your veins? Like, what do you do with that in the time of trouble? Now, I want to compare that with my mother's favorite hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. Now, let me read these lyrics. What a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forward forfeit oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer have we trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In the time of trouble, I'm not going to be talking about running up and down mountains and kings and vein on fire. I want to know Jesus is my friend. Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. You can't just sing anything. Back to Daniel. Daniel. Wherefore, at, the time, at that time, certain Chaldeans came there and accused the Jews. So the music played. They tried to get them to do it. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Daniel 3.10, Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the musical instruments shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Then he says in verse 12, there are certain Jews. What kind of Jews? That means that there were some Jews that weren't, that bowed. See, I want to be of the certain Christians in the last days. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded them to bring these three boys. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? He brings them down. He's angry. He's shown them favor. Is it true that you will not bow and worship the God that I set up? Now look at what he does. This is what the devil will do. He gives them a second chance. Now, if you be ready, that the time you hear all the sound of the music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, it's all good, it's well, don't worry, I'll forget you didn't bow down. But if you worship not, 
You shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And look at the question Nebuchadnezzar asks them. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Young people, this is the question the world is asking you now. But this is where the story gets good. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, look at what they say. We are not careful to answer you in this matter. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, we're not worried. We're not afraid. We're not even going to mince our words. We're not even going to try and be polite. We are going to say it like it is. And then they say, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. He said, if it's necessary, our God will deliver us. The story is powerful because of verse 18. They say, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They said, listen, our God is able to deliver us, but even if he chooses not to, it doesn't matter. Our allegiance to him is not determined by whether or not he delivers us. Amen. And you know why they could make that statement? Because they understood God's character. Amen. You see, a lot of people are not, they can't, their Christian walk is messed up because they don't understand who God is. If you understand how much he loves you, you can be completely loyal to him because you understand that no matter what happens, he's looking out for your best interest. They said, we, we know him so well, we trust him so much, he loves us and we love him, that if he chooses that we die, we trust him with our lives. Now Nebuchadnezzar was really mad. He was full of fury, the Bible says, and the form of his visage, his face changed against the three of them. In other words, he went from liking them to hating them in one second. Therefore he spake and he commanded that he should heat the furnace, how many times hotter? Seven times hotter than it want to be heated. Remember, they, they're masters at furnaces because they don't have stone. They have to make brick. So they know how to make the kiln super hot, 1,300 degrees hot. These guys knew how to make it hot. So they went and made it hotter. And he commanded the mightiest men that were in his army to bind the three boys and cast them into the burning fire furnace. So he doesn't just make it hot. He ties them up. He wraps them up. And they were bound in their coats, their holes in their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Why did he leave them in their clothes? What was the hope? You burn faster. He bound them, tied them up, and the mightiest men brought them towards the opening of the furnace. Verse 22, therefore because of the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the, the flames of the flyer, what, who did they kill? The men that took the three boys up, the, three, the strongest men in his army, went close to the fire. They didn't even get in the fire, and it killed them. That's how hot it was. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. Why was Nebuchadnezzar astonished? It says, he rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, didn't we cast just three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said, yep, that's true, king. Three men bound. That's who we threw into the fire. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. Look at this. And the form of the fourth one is like the son of God. Let me tell you something. You know what trials do? When Satan has bound you in bad habits, when Satan has bound you in, in, in character defects, when Satan has bound you in all kinds of stuff, it is the furnace of fire, the trials that you go through. We'll talk about that in evening worship tonight, you, that you go through. It is literally the trials that burns off what binds you. This is why the church of Laodicea, you're supposed to, you're supposed to be like gold tried in the fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. Notice how his, everything changed now. Come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men who, upon whose bodies the fire had what? No power. 
nor was a hair of their head singed, neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Not only did they survive the fire, the fire didn't even leave a scent. This is a statement to you of how powerful God is at protecting his children. You're going to pass through fire in this life, young people. But if you're faithful to God, not even the scent of it will be left on you. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants and, and trusted in him, uh, that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Now, he makes a mistake here and goes back to this, this church state union here, but that every people, nation, language would speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there's no other God that can deliver after this sort. And look at what happens. They go from being prisoners, being thrown into a fiery furnace to verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Their faithfulness not only led to them living, it led to them getting a promotion. Can you imagine how mad all those other guys were now? We'll close with these quotes from Ellen White. Prophets and Kings, page 512. Important are the lessons to be learned from the experience of the Hebrew youth on the plain of Dura. Here it is, young people. In this our day, many of God's servants, though innocent of wrongdoing, will be given over to suffer humiliation and abuse at the hands of those who, inspired by Satan, are filled with envy and religious bigotry. Especially will the wrath of man be aroused against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. And at least a universal decree will, de and at last, a universal decree will denounce these as deserving of death. Young people, you know why this is so important? Because if we can't keep God's commandments now, if we don't take the Sabbath seriously now, do you think you're going to take it seriously when persecution is the price of keeping the Sabbath? That's why we take it seriously now. Because if, you don't, if, you, if the Sabbath is just something and you just do whatever you want and you, and you don't take the Sabbath seriously, not when the time comes, and say, listen, you can't buy or sell. You're going to have to move out of your house. You can't keep your job. You're going to face ridicule and scorn for keeping the Sabbath. If now when there's no penalty for keeping it, you can't keep it. You think you're going to really keep it then? Jeremiah 12, 5. Jeremiah says, if you, have, if, you have, if you can't keep up with the footmen, how are you going to run with the horses? If you can't do God's will today in a time of peace, how are you going to serve God when the war comes? She says, the season of distress before God's people will call for a faith that will not falter. His children must make it manifest that he is the only object of their worship and that no consideration, not even that of life itself, can induce them to make the least concession to false worship. This is why the music part is so important. To the loyal heart, the commands of sinful, finite men will sink into insignificance beside the word of the eternal God. Truth will be obeyed, though the result be imprisonment or exile or death. As in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so in the closing period of earth's history, the Lord will work mightily in behalf of those who stand steadfastly for the right. He who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain. Last one. In the midst of the time of trouble, trouble such as has not been since the, there was a nation, his chosen ones will stand unmoved. Satan with all his, the hosts of evil cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Angels that excel in strength will protect them and in their behalf Jehovah will reveal himself as a God of gods able to save to the uttermost those who have put their trust in him. Young people, now is the time to build that trust relationship with God. Now is the time to make your calling and election sure. You are at Blue Mountain Academy, and I say this every time I come, it's not an accident. God has every one of you, even the ones of you that are sitting here that are least interested, you're sitting here for a reason. Because God has a calling on your life that you will be Daniel's. 
Shadrachs, Meshachs, Abednegoes, Esthers, that you will one day stand in the face of a wicked and dreadful world and you will stand undaunted at the world's threats and you will stand just as they did and in standing the entire Babylonian empire, all the dignitaries saw that there's only one God who can deliver. Young people, you're called to do that in these last days. But I've got good news for you. You're not called to stand alone. In the fire, Christ will be with you. Just as he walked with them, he will walk with you. But start your walk now. Take every devotion, every morning, take it seriously. Every Bible class, take every lecture seriously. Every time the speakers come and speak here, take it seriously. Absorb, 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 like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys did. They were students of the prophet Jeremiah. So when they went to Babylon, they were prepared to stand. If you want to be prepared and ready to stand in this last day and face what the king of Babylon is going to throw at us, I want you to stand with me as we pray. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them the faithful few all hail to Daniel's band dare to be a Daniel dare to stand alone dare to have a purpose firm dare to make it known many mighty men are lost Daring not to stand Who for God had been a host By joining Daniel's band Dare to be a Daniel Dare to stand alone Dare to have a purpose firm Dare to make it known Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land, headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Hold the gospel banner high on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing strong so that the world would see how strong you are, God. This isn't just another school. The curriculum isn't just another curriculum. And what they're being given here is the food, the spiritual food that was given to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they were able to stand no matter what. Strengthen the resolve of these students. Build their spiritual resilience. Help them to make Jesus their all. That when they have to face the fiery furnace, like the three Hebrew boys, they will say, we are not careful to answer. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated.